As the Lazarus Island superstorms continue to crisscross the globe, how will it affect the Superman family of characters? Well, let's hop into the pages of Lazarus Planet Assault on Krypton issue number one and find out together, shall we? Alrighty then, so I'll fully admit when I picked up this issue, I didn't know what I was in for or really what kind of event Lazarus Planet was going to be when it comes to actually doling out information. What we basically get treated to here is an anthology book made up of several smaller stories all tangentially connected to the Superman family of books books using the events of Lazarus Planet as a framing device. First up, we got a story featuring Naya Nal, aka Dreamer, who I must say, as far as CW canon immigrants go, she's been doing a great job sticking around. We actually see that Naya was offered a job at the Daily Planet by Cat Grant. Unfortunately, before she can agree one way or another, her Dreamer powers end up activating. She sees a vision of a golden helmet before eventually seeing nothing at all, which is strange because that would imply the world is going to end very soon. This vision actually turns out to be a dream being had by none other than a very injured Batman over at the Hall of Justice as he is watched over by Supergirl and Robin. Dreamer pops out of Batman's head just long enough to get up to speed on everything that's going down with Lazarus Island exploding as well as the Helmet of Fate, something that up until now she wasn't exactly sure of. It's here too, the book actually goes out of its way to answer a question that I'm sure a lot of people have had since Batman vs. Robin, and that is that if the Devil Neza, the big villain of this Mark Waid's super story had the helmet of fate. What happened to its old master, Khalid, the current Doctor Fate? Well, Batman comes to just long enough to send Dreamer on a super special mission to go look for Khalid and try and get to the bottom of all of this. No doubt if they plan to defeat King Firebull and set the world right after all of these super storms, they're probably going to need one of the most powerful magic users on their side. Here's the big problem though, when Dreamer goes undercover at the hospital, she discovers that Khalid actually has has no memory of being Dr. Fate, Nabu, or indeed anything super. We already know that the Devil Neza can manipulate people's minds and turn them against their friends and allies, but in this situation, it looks like he forced Khalid to forget that he was even Dr. Fate to begin with. Luckily, Dreamer actually gets some help in the form of the Spirit of the Helmet. Nabu, or at least whatever is left of Nabu, actually directs her through a magical portal. Unfortunately for her, that portal ends up opening up within the Lazarus Pit itself where the helmet was thrown at the end of that Batman v. Robin story. Keep in mind, the Lazarus pits have been tainted for a while now, so that is most certainly a place that Dreamer should not be. That's where this story ends, but the book promises that we'll circle back to this eventually. From there, we actually get a story featuring John Kent the Superman. He's doing his best to keep the peace in Metropolis, even though some people, like this mysterious young man here, are using the chaos to try and commit crimes. John and this new mystery character both end up getting pelted by Lazarus Rain, which ends up having some very unforeseen reactions on both of them. John ends up glowing blue and electric, a nice little precursor to what we'll be seeing over in his new miniseries. And even the thief that he was trying to apprehend ends up getting powers too. Even though this guy was stealing stuff, he's shown to not be completely evil as he actually brings John to safety. In fact, they do a really good job showcasing that leather jacket guy here is basically kind of an inverse of John himself. He has a good heart, doesn't actively want to hurt anyone, but his moral compass is completely broken, and he just can't seem to stop stealing. Still, though, John feels bad for him and decides to try and take him under his wing for that day, especially as he tries to deal with the fact that he has brand new superpowers. Leather Jacket Guy thinks to himself now that he has superpowers, he should probably think of a good name for himself. You know, something related to volcanoes. It's a shame that all the volcano names are either taken or really bad. It's once again, while out saving people, John John's powers end up reacting again with that same blue electric energy causing him to pass out. It's here that Leather Jacket Guy claims that he probably lost his powers when the rain hit him again, and so John decides to cut him a break and let him loose. Here's the problem, though. John realizes that his cape is missing. And when he goes back to this guy's apartment, he sees that he's already cleared out. He also sees that he very much did keep those powers and has decided on a name for himself, Ash. Want to see where the story goes from here? Be sure to pick up the new Superman book and the new John miniseries coming soon. Now after that, we actually get a Luthor-centric story. We see that him and all of his people are holed up inside the LexCorp building. Lex's big plan seems to be just to wait for all of this to blow over, but unfortunately fate ends up intervening and Mercy Graves, Lex's longtime bodyguard and driver, ends up getting struck by Lazarus Lightning, which gives her powers. And not a moment too soon either, as Mercy is going to have to use these brand new powers if she hopes to 
save the rest of LexCorp's staff from a bunch of animal test subjects that are currently rampaging thanks to the storm. What can Mercy actually do now? Well, it seems that she's become the Gel Man Terminator from Terminator 2, meaning that things are probably going to get very, very interesting the next time she should come face to face with Superman. Now, the final story in this anthology pack is actually a Power Girl story. You'll remember that she had returned in the pages of Infinite Frontier, but didn't really do anything before eventually reinforcing the heroes here in this story. If you're like me too, you're probably asking yourself, wait, is this the Kara Zor-El of Earth 2, by which I mean the New 52 Earth 2, or is this Karen Starr back again? Hell, for all I know, she could actually be another version of Linda Danvers. Well, guess what? Apparently Power Girl in this story herself also has no idea who she is. In fact, she only knows a few things to be certain that she is a survivor of Krypton and Kandor, that she's good with machines, and honestly, that's about it. The last time we saw Power Girl in the pages of the Lazarus Planet storyline, her alongside Shazam, Mary Marvel, and Zatanna were fighting the Silver Horned King. However, it was during that fight, Power Girl ended up falling through some sort of strange psychic wormhole that she can't seem to get out of right now, a wormhole that is getting very rude and very personal to her. The deeper she goes into this kaleidoscope nightmare world, though, she eventually ends up coming face to face with Omen, aka Lilith Clay. We all remember her, right? The Teen Titans' most powerful psychic? A character who, for some reason, just has a terrible habit of falling off the face of the Earth for years at a time? Well, she's back now, everybody. And she claims that if her and Power Girl work together, then they can eventually find their way out of this weird, colorful world as the comic comes to a close. And so that was Lazarus Planet Assault on Krypton issue number one, everyone. And overall, I thought this collection of stories were fine. None of them were particularly amazing or knock your socks off. In fact, most of them didn't even really have beginnings, middles, or ends. And really only the first one has any real connection to the story that's going on in Lazarus Planet. Everything else is just kind of tangentially connected right now. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Really what this book seems to exist to do is to try and get you excited for all the brand new Superman stories that are coming down the pipeline soon, as well as set up the idea that the Lazarus Planet event in the Superstorms could be used as a good jumping off point to create brand new characters. And in that regard, I think the book definitely succeeds in what it was trying to do. I would only ask all of you out there to be aware before you actually pick up the book yourself. If any of what I mentioned sounds good, I think you'll enjoy it. If not, I don't think it'll make you a believer. Overall, I'd give this one a 7 out of 10. Perfectly adequate, perfectly enjoyable, but it did leave me asking, hey, when is the next actual important installment of Lazarus Planet starting? Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cave Jewel, and if you're seeing me right now, that means you watched to the end of the video, which I am very appreciative of. It really helps drive engagement and retention and all that other good YouTube stuff. So does liking and commenting. Wink, wink. If you like my content, too, you should check out my Patreon page. We just redid all the tiers, so there's a ton of great rewards. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, and, well, it would just really help me out. It's never expected, but always appreciated. So until next time, everyone, I've been Cape Joel, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.